Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of State of Our Nation. Now, this morning, we are going to be delving into the issues uh, surrounding the conundrum faced by a section of the voting public, uh, those persons that are COVID-19 positive, but because they would be in isolation and prohibited under the COVID directives to leave said isolation, uh, they would not be allowed uh, to vote at least that's the position thus far now the ebc has made it clear that their hands are tied as the the law doesn't provide any any provisions for persons to vote out any in any alternative way other than in person at the at the ballot box and also they are adhering to the actual regulations which state that those persons can't leave isolation now this situation has been compounded by the fact that uh, we just had a recent release of a study from the University of the West Indies, which shows that the possibility of cases at peak due to the Omicron, Omicron variant, sorry, I always get that pronunciation a little fuzzy, the Omicron variant uh, going as high as 3,500 cases at peak daily. Now, this now could mean that instead of just hundreds of persons you possibly can have tens of thousands of persons um not being able to exercise their franchise now here to unpack all of this with me is constitutional lawyer um a veteran in the field mr garth patterson qc uh welcome mr patterson to state of our nation hi good morning Calder. okay now feel free to step in at any point but basically Paint me a picture of what this situation means, as I would have outlined, uh, for those persons right now. What's the situation as it stands for those persons right now in isolation? And right now, by the way, let me add that the number stands at around 3,000 persons, which is at, by itself is a significant chunk of persons that would be disenfranchised. Right. So bear in mind that when the elections were called, uh, the number stood somewhere around 1,200, close to 1,500 persons in isolation. Um, at the time, the government was aware of the Omicron virus, the o Omicron variant, and would have anticipated, based on what was happening globally, that those numbers were going to increase dramatically. So we're seeing at this stage where those numbers have more than doubled since the calling of the elections. And, and the reasonable likelihood is that we could be facing numbers in the region of five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people by the time the elections come around. 7,000 people who will be in isolation or quarantine. And by virtue of um, being in isolation or quarantine, uh, will be prevented from going out to vote. The ABC has made it clear, and it's not because of the EBC, but because the um, COVID directives that are in place dictate that you stay at home if you're uh, infected with the virus and you, you must isolate or quarantine. And it means that those people will be deprived of the opportunity to vote. Now, as it relates to uh, the right of voting, uh, clearly conducting el elections, general elections, in a climate where there is a global, global pandemic, where thousands of people will predictably be deprived of that opportunity, the question has to be asked whether or not um, the, the infringement of those rights is something that can be challenged in the courts. Um, the right to vote, remember, is a right that is enshrined in the Representation of the People's Act. It says that every qualified voter has the right to vote. Um, clearly, where these elections are being held in circumstances where thousands of people will not be 
afforded the opportunity to vote because they have to quarantine or remain in isolation, then that right to vote is clearly being infri infringed. And so the question is, can someone take action in relation to that? Okay. Now, let me let me try to get a breaking headline here. Um, by chance, has, has any, because this has been a hot button issue for a, a few days now, at least since the election has been called, has, has anyone approached you yet uh, about um, a challenge of sort? I have been approached, um, but I, I am not, I have not been asked to institute proceedings. Okay. All right. Um, no, but it certainly is my view. And I, I've noticed that there are people in the press saying that uh, the courts effectively have no jurisdiction to interfere with the dissolution of parliament, which is the exclusive preserve of the president and the prime minister, acting on the advice of the prime minister. Uh, but I disagree. I, I think that there is clearly a basis on which the courts can intervene, and uh, if you if you wish, I could I could outline that for you. Actually, well, yes, that's that's what that's actually going to be my next question. I want us to break down uh, legal options for those persons at this point in a before and after the election. I mean, <laughs> what are the options before the election is called, and also from a, from an after perspective, um, given the fact that at least we we have seen <coughs> one political um candidate uh political leader stating that the integrity of the elections can be called into question can you have a situation at the end and at the aftermath where the results are questioned because so many persons have been disenfranchised i think your best position is challenging the election before they occur once the elections occur then uh, your rights are going to be much more limited. And so that in terms of uh, a challenge before the elections occur, the, the basis would typically be one of two things, either a constitutional challenge or a, a challenge in the public interest. Uh, that, that second one is called a judicial review ch challenge. And Typically, a person could challenge the actions of the government or any public official or authority by way of a public law challenge. And this is usually done by an application for judicial review under the Administrative Justice Act, which entitles any person whose interests are adversely affected by an administrative act or omission or any person who satisfies the court that his application is justifiable in the public interest to make an application to that court. The essential characteristics of a public interest challenge are that it raises public law issues which are of general importance where the applicant has no private interest in the outcome of the case. And so it applies to any decision, determination, advice, or recommendation made under power or duty conferred or imposed by the Constitution or by any enactment, any law. And the government bodies or persons whose actions may be reviewed include ministers, public officials, tribunals, and any authority of the government that's exercising or purporting to exercise any power or duty conferred on him by the Constitution or by any other law. So in, in the context of, of these elections, you are looking at a power that is given to the president to dissolve parliament and the president must act on the advice of the Prime Minister. Um, the Caribbean Court of Justice has said that every person or institution in Barbados functions under the Barbados Constitution. 
that being the supreme law of the land. And every such person is duty bound to act rationally, reasonably, and fairly. Since the power and duty to dissolve parliament is conferred by the constitution on the president who must act on the advice of the prime minister, then the president and the prime minister are both in discharging that constitutional responsibility um, and uh, they're bound to exercise those powers and duties in a manner that promotes the rule of law and is consistent with the letter and policy of the constitution and any applicable electoral laws so that the president and the prime minister are bound to act rationally reasonably and fairly in discharging those solemn constitutional duties. So the question is, can the government's decision to dissolve parliament and to hold elections during a pandemic, can that be challenged through the courts by way of a judicial review application? And my view is that it can. And the voter can do so if he can establish that the government in calling the elections at this time during the pandemic breached this constitutional duty of rational fear and reasonable decision making or it contravened the substance or policy of any applicable law or constitutional provision the the point is that no government can freely ignore the law and because the right to vote is enshrined in the representation of People's Act, which the Constitution mandates must make provision for every qualified voter to have a reasonable opportunity of voting in an election, then it means that the, um, the actions of the government are certainly amenable to judicial review. Okay. Um, the President dissolve parliament at a time when thousands of voters were in isolation and when it was reasonably foreseeable by the government that many thousands more would in the near term become infected by the variant the omicron variant of the covid 19. to my mind it is arguable that in the absence of any overriding national interest or some other compelling reasons for doing so the actions of the president acting on the advice of the prime minister could be challenged on the basis that it was neither rational nor reasonable, nor was it fair to the thousands of voters who will likely be deprived of that reasonable opportunity of voting. The protection of which, the right to vote, was the underlying policy behind the constitution. This is one of the express bases on which the court can grant judicial review, which is that the, the impugned act or decision is in conflict with the policy of an act of parliament, including the, the constitution. Okay. No, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. You, 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 you asked me if in those circumstances the court has jurisdiction to stop the elections and in my view it certainly does more so because the electoral law itself the representation of the people's act fails to make any adequate provision for voting other than by in-person voting at the polling station so you've seen overseas where voting occurs either by in by in-person voting voting by mail some places have electronic voting. These are all options that were open to the government, which, which certainly had the ability to amend the law to allow for these options prior to calling the elections. Now in failing to make those amendments, to make provision for alternative forms of voting other than in-person voting, the question is certainly whether in doing so, the electoral law that now exists in this in this context during this pandemic whether that law um, is consistent with or whether it violates 
the mandate under the constitution, which is to make reasonable make provision for to ensure make provision to ensure that every qualified voter has a reasonable opportunity of voting we're saying i i, I believe that the the law as it currently exists fails to do so and that in those circumstances the court has jurisdiction to stop the elections from proceeding under law that is on its face unconstitutional okay now given the fact that the litmus test is reasonableness and being reasonable um, within the context of ensuring that persons have that have the right to vote can do so at this 11th hour um because we are nine days away from the polls um what reversal can be done to ensure that those provisions are made what corrections can be made at this point allowable under the constitution to ensure that those amendments that's just the, the representation of the people's act that let's say may may um, allow persons to do mail-in val ballots or face a polling a separate polling station outside of constitutional of the constituency boundaries and allow persons that are covid positive to vote there that's just one example i'm just i'm just i'm just speaking from the top of my head here now um because that would require recalling parliament is that allowable at this point uh, at this 11th hour yeah the 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 the, the, the power exists the, the jurisdiction the parliament the, the prime minister has the power the president has the power under the constitution to um summon the parliament even though it has been dissolved it has the power to summon the parliament where there where an emergency exists. So this this these elections were called in a state of emergency. Since the dis dissolution of parliament, a new emergency has occurred, a more pressing emergency. Same same problem, but different degree, and that is the Omicron virus. And so you're seeing the explosion of cases occurring globally and in Barbados. And so you've moved from a position where possibly 1,000, 1,500 people would have been deprived of the right to vote to a position where you may be well into the thousands or tens of thousands by the time you come around to the elections. I mean, certainly at the rate that we're seeing um, new cases arise, there's every possibility that you're going to be faced with more than 5,000 people being deprived of the right to vote. Bear in mind, in, in 2018, um, a group of Commonwealth nationals who were being excluded from the voters list went to the court and the CCJ issued a decision saying, no, they have to be put on the list. Their CCJ intervened to protect the rights of a handful of voters. So what's the position of the courts where you're faced with a possibility of thousands of voters, not 1,000, not 2,000, not 3,000, but thousands, possibly five, ten thousand 10,000 people being deprived of the right to vote? Does the court just sit back idly and say, that's fine? It can, it can never be it can never be okay to um, disenfranchise such a large number of people I think the courts take the view that the disenfranchisement of even one voter is intolerable much less that of thousands of voters in circumstances where there's no real pressing national interest or overriding uh, uh, con uh, compelling reasons. If this was, if this was a case where the elections were constitutionally due, then you know even then it would be problematic. Okay. But it's not constitutionally due, and the government had more than enough time to put in place the necessary arrangements to facilitate the voting by. Um, qualified voters, including COVID voters, 
I'm not suggesting or advocating at all that these voters, these persons who are COVID positive, should put the public health at risk by going out to vote. What I'm saying is that the government ought to have put in place facilities such as mail-in voting, electronic voting, to allow those persons to vote from home. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Now, without revealing too much, obviously, because I, I get the sense that um, things are just still in the works and, and, and they are not ready to go public as yet. But without revealing too much detail, what's the likelihood of, you know, from your end, the consultation that you would have had with, you know, that person who is interested in, in um, or at least getting a legal opinion on, on the current status of those COVID-19 positive persons in isolation? What's the, what's the, what's the possibility of progressing to an actual challenge um, in court? And also, um, given that we fact that we are nine days out from an election, what's, what's the likelihood of it even being heard at this 11th hour uh, uh, going through the full process? It can be heard. There's no question that the court can uh, hear this on an emergency basis, an urgent application where you, you face the possibility of thousands. It's not just COVID. It, it, it is not an action that is just limited to people who are infected with COVID. Any public-spirited citizen has the right to say, look, I believe that the, the elections are going to be conducted on the circumstances that will deprive a swath of electors from their right to vote. And that's not democratic. And um, we want the court's intervention. Uh, the challenge that we're going to face isn't the timing of hearing the application. Uh, but let's say that the court were to say to the court, the government, well, no, you have to put in place facilities to allow COVID-19 people to vote. You're running the risk that in doing so, the government would, would basically have to lift the COVID directives and allow people to go out and vote and expose, um, expose thousands uh, and, and thousands of people to the COVID virus. Um, the alternative would be for Parliament to be reconvened and pass new laws and put in place a system for voting, which cannot happen between now and the 19th of January. The court, the, the, the government can, uh, the, the, the president can postpone the elections for 30 days. Uh, but even then, that wouldn't be enough time to put in place those um, legislative changes and the infrastructure necessary to facilitate mail-in voting and so on. So as a practical matter, the only option that's open to the government right now would be to lift the COVID directives, which is inherently dangerous for the public. The other alternative would be to to stop the elections altogether. Mm. Um, that's something that the court could say, well, in in these circumstances, because it's proceeding on the, an electoral law that is inherently unconstitutional in that it fails to secure for a, a, a large number of voters, thousands of voters, the opportunity to vote. That's clearly not doing what it was constitutionally meant to do and compelled to do which is to protect the, in the, the sacred right, the sacrosanct right, of every voter to vote. And it's not a small thing to deprive people of that right. And so if it means stopping the elections and saying, go, then we'll then come again, then I, I think the courts certainly have the power to do so. And, and the, the other half of my question, do you think there's likely to be a challenge? I don't know. I you don't know. No, I mean, the, the thing is that it would have to come from a political party as a practical man, because any litigation is expensive. And um, people aren't going to sub, you know, risk, expose themselves to the risk, the financial risk associated with bringing litigation um, 
if they are going to ultimately have to foot that. No, the courts have the power if they, if they, if if the application is successful, to allow that person to recover those costs from the government. Um, but that's if the application is successful. If, if the application fails, there's a real risk that the costs of the litigation could be borne by the person making the application. So it, it, it makes sense that it would be one of the parties that would have to, um, the political parties that would have to bring the challenge as distinct from an individual, even though an individual is, has every right to bring that application himself. Okay. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is give you the final say on anything else that we may have glossed over, um, especially given the fact that, as I said, this is an unprecedented situation, at least from a layman's perspective. I've never heard about it, um, anything such, any such uh, eventualities. Um, anything you want to add uh, as it relates to maybe the precedent that, let's say this goes unchecked, what precedent it might be setting? And if it goes challenged, if it, cha if it is challenged, also what precedent that it would, would establish as well? I mean, this is a once in a century global pandemic. So and it's not likely to occur again anytime soon. Um, but more importantly, the precedent it sets is that um, the awesome power to um, call elections and to determine the timing of the elections could be exercised in a manner in the future, which is aimed at um, obtaining some political advantage for, for the party who is who is um, calling the elections or who has the right to call those elections. Um, I'm not saying that that's the case here. Clearly, this is a case where a, a pandemic has existed and that the government has determined, I'm not suggesting at all, to call it in the pandemic to achieve a political advantage. But I'm saying that if the if if the um, if the if the circumstances here suggest that the government has the right by exercising the constitutional power of dissolving parliament to disenfranchise thousands and thousands of voters under these circumstances, then it could do so under other circumstances that might conceivably arise in the future. Uh, and the question is whether or not the courts should, um, the courts have a role to play in ensuring that this sacros sacrosanct right is protected even at the expense of um, delaying elections until such time as uh, the infrastructure, the uh, necessary legislative framework is in place to allow for alternative forms of voting. Okay. All right, folks, there you have it uh, from the constitutional expert. Uh, again, Mr. Patterson, I really want to thank you for taking the time uh, to join us this morning to really lay out the nuts and bolts of this issue. Uh, it has been a hot button issue uh, for uh, some time now, and I think uh, persons would have gained some clarity as to where uh, things really stand. So again, thank you again, Mr. Patterson, and thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in to State of Our Nation.